Hi, it's Caitlin from the Ocean Tracking Network. In this course, Bruce Dello, Solutions Analyst at OTN, will build onto the Intro to GLaDOS workshop, session three in this workshop series. You'll learn how to use the R package GLaDOS to create abacus plots, group data by fish or receiver, and layer in station deployment history. By the end of this session, you'll know how to animate animal movement on a base map using GLaDOS functions. This course is part of an acoustic telemetry workshop series and includes examples that will help you along the way. Before you get started, make sure to download and install the files required for this lesson using the link in the description below so that you can get started at home. My name is Bruce Dello. I'm gonna be taking you through some of the visualization features that come bundled with GLaTOS. Um, GLaTOS gives you a lot of functionality for visualizing your data and uh, it can automate some of the things that you've seen and, and do some of that work for you. So it's, it's good to have this in your back pocket. Uh, the code I'm gonna be following along with is in the repo and it's called vizandanimations.r. If you pull that down and open that up, uh, that's what I'm gonna be working with. Uh, I'm also going to be reading off, I believe lessons nine and 10 from the, uh, from the, the website. So if you want to follow along with those uh, and not, you know, necessarily be running the code, that works too. Uh, but that being said, let's get started on some visualization and uh, animations. The first thing you'll see is a big brick of comments followed by a function declaration called make transition with invert. I, I'll, I'll start by explaining this, uh, I suppose, because it's going to be very important later. Um, in the course of a lot of our visualization and animations in this section, we're going to be using a polygon shape file to describe the coast of Nova Scotia. So um, basically just a picture of what the coastlines of Nova Scotia look like. Uh, and that's going to give us the geographical context for the detections that we've picked up so that we can you know, animate them against something. Uh, we'll show you how to get a shape file when we get to it. Um, but you might be wondering, why the inverted? Why do we need to invert what we're doing here? Um, the reason for that is, is kind of interesting and a, uh, a useful object lesson in uh, being careful with how you use your packages. Um, when the, the, the equivalent GLaTOS function is just called make transition, uh, and that makes a transition layer for your animation. Um, the transition layer is just a way of describing uh, what parts of the map are water and what parts are land. Uh, we'll talk about it a little more in detail when we get to it. For now, that's the, the crux of it. Uh, so you pass a shapefile to make transition. It spits out uh, a, uh, a raster layer with some parts in water, some parts on land. Uh, based on the shape value provided. So far, uh, so normal. But the reason we need to invert it is because GLaTOS, uh, the GL in GLaTOS stands for Great Lakes, uh, this software was designed to run on lakes. So if you pass it a fully bounded polygon, it will assume that you have passed it a lake. Uh, and the first time I ran this code, I ran into, I, I spent probably the better part of a day trying to figure out how to convince my cute computer that Nova Scotia wasn't a lake. Um, so uh, ultimately what I did is some of the underlying functions allow you to just flip the output, um, make transition uh, calls other functions from other libraries to create its transition layer and one of those lets you reverse the output. So that's all that make transition inverted does. Uh, it lets you pass in a fully bounded polygon that represents land instead of water, and you just choose to invert the output. Um, this is this function that I'm going to ask you to uh, to compile and define uh, in a second is uh, it's just a stopgap measure. There is. A, uh, a version of this that has been merged into the development branch of GLaTOS. So whenever they merge their development branch into their master branch and make another release, uh, this function will become, the, 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 the ability to invert your output um, will be added to the, um, 
will be added to the the package itself. Uh, but for now, we do need to use this function. So yeah, you'll see all of these uh, all of these comments. Those are just uh, documentation for the function itself. You can read through them if you want. It's not necessary though. Uh, and down here on line 116 of visinanimations.r, you see make transition with invert and then a function declaration. Uh, this invert parameter false is the one that we are going to want. So if you position your cursor on line 116, something like that, and you run that line, it will skip right to the end of it. And uh, that function has now been, you can see over here, uh, entered into R, uh, into this particular kernel of R. Yeah, so if anyone's curious, that's just a giant uh, block of function code. So if anyone wants to learn how to write functions, you can explore into it. But for our purposes, you just need to run it. <laughs> yep. And also, the uh, you know, I have tried to make clear what it's for and what it does. It'll probably become more clear as you see how that shape file is used and how that raster layer is used. So um, I have to get my data ready. So I've got to make sure that I've got the Latos library. So I'll set up my detections file. And I'll set up my receivers file the detection file name, the receiver file name. And then I'm going to use our read OTN detections function on the detection file that we have defined. And we can always just use head to check and make sure, yep, we have imported our data. You see a couple lines there. You can see over here, we've got 3,000 observations. So all good. Uh, I'm going to do some of the same detection filtering to make sure that we've got a data set that's more usable, cleaner. So we'll do that. Filter that down to detections filtered. Filter that down to just the ones that pass the filter. Check that we've got, we have indeed uh, got a set with fewer rows. And once we've got those filtered, we are going to compress those down to detection events using the detection events. And uh, we are going to add a group column for each event group. So we run that code. We've set up this variable detections with events. Uh, it's got 1,233 distinct events. Um, so we've taken our data. We've loaded it out of our CSV file. And with just a few lines of code, we've used GLaTOS to uh, clean it up and get it into a state that's going to be a little more amenable to plotting. I'm just going to clear away this uh, graph of the minimum lag threshold there, uh, just so that we've got a nice, nice clean area to plot into. Uh, I'm sorry, I kind of breezed past the false detections filter. Um, I should mention what it does. It filters your data sets uh, to try to remove uh, false detections. The way that it determines false detections is it uses time. It's the interval between two consecutive detections of the animal. The minimum lag time either between the next or the previous detection of that animal. Yes. So that uh, if that interval is very close together, that suggests that what you're actually getting is the same, uh, the same hit uh, bounced off a nearby wall or pinging again or uh, any any sort of distortion underwater that might make that appear twice or three times or four times consecutively. So what the false detection filter does is it looks for those kinds of groupings and it compresses them down to just the one event. Yeah, um, the, the false detection filter um, because uh, if you've read the, the Pincock paper describing how two uh, detections can collide and create a third tag ID that isn't either of the correct tag IDs. You'll get these isolated single tag IDs uh, in the middle of nowhere, no uh, no correlation to any other detections of that tag. Um, the detection filter takes anything uh, over the time threshold you feed it, uh, and if there are no other detections of that tag within that time threshold, it will identify that as a potential false detection because uh, it could have possibly come from the collision of two other tags that were pinging at the same time. Uh, Doug Pincock has a paper on it. Uh, if you look at the documentation for the false detection filter, there's a link to the paper in there. Um, but this basically automates 
the implementation of his algorithm against your data set to help you find uh, isolated individual detections. Um, the grouping, the detection events function will take subsequent uh, detections at the same station. If you have 10 detections in a row at one station, it will collapse that into one row with the start and the end time like we saw during Ryan's talk. That in mind, we have got uh, our detections. We've got them filtered down to just uh, detection events. Now we can actually start visualizing them. Um, one of the first ways that we're gonna do that and one of the quickest, quickest and dirtiest ways uh, is with an abacus plot. GLaTOS has a built-in abacus plot function. Uh, what we are gonna do is uh, we are gonna pass in our detections with events. Uh, we are gonna let it know that the station column is representative of locations. Um, and we're gonna give it a name uh, using this main parameter. So this line right here, we're gonna run that. And as you can see over here, we get this uh, quite, quite cluttered abacus plot showing uh, if you can sort of parse in there uh, in that, that left-hand column, I'll make it a little bigger. Uh, you can see we have got our stations on the left. We've got our date on the uh, x-axis. And then our plot here is every time uh, a detection event was registered on a given uh, station. Pretty quickly, we can get ourselves spun up with a, uh, with a plot showing our detections over time at a given station. Um, but you have probably noticed a, uh, you've probably noticed a problem with this plot. It's quite cluttered. Uh, it's, we can, can, you know, we could continue to make it bigger. We could continue to uh, make, uh, you know, try to zoom in further, see what we can parse out. Um, but it's still pretty dense. It can be a little difficult to figure out uh, what we're looking at. You can see there are some spaces you know, here, here, where uh, the detections are pretty clustered. Um, so it can be tricky to figure out what you're looking at if, you're, uh, if you've got a, a plot like this. What we can do, instead of just making the plot bigger and bigger and bigger, because that may not be always feasible, depending on maybe you need to put it in a paper, or maybe you just, maybe, this is how big it's going to be. Um, we can pick a single fish to plot on. We can choose just one of our fish, uh, and we can make an abacus plot showing only where that fish was detected. And we can do that using the animal ID. So the way you do that is, uh, as we saw in the Intro to R uh, workshop, we can take just a little slice of our uh, filtered detections, um, and we can select only those detections where the animal ID is equal to uh, NSBS hooker. That's the shark we're going to use. We could use any shark. Uh, I use this one because it's, it's got good data. Sometimes there's not a complicated reason for a thing. Um, other than that, same. Uh, column, we're going to use station for our location, and we're just going to change the name that we give it to be a little more descriptive. So if we do that, run that abacus plot, we can see right away, and I'll give you a look over here, right away our data is cleaned up a lot because we are just looking at the detections from one animal. We are just looking at the stations where it was detected. So it wasn't detected on every station. We are only looking at a subset of our stations where this fish was detected. And our data is easier to read because we know that it only applies to this one fish. So that's uh, one of the ways that we can make our data a little easier to read. Uh, you could extend this out. Uh, the way we are doing it is just slicing from our array. So if you wanted to do it on two or three animals, you could do that as well. Um, any subset of your animals that you want to plot, you can plot. Um, so yeah, without much extra effort as far as coding goes, we can take a very cluttered abacus plot, difficult to read, uh, requires a lot of parsing. We can make it something a little simpler, a little easier for us. Uh, we can also plot on a subset of our uh, receivers. 
I will show you how to do that uh, using our code to isolate a particular subset. Um, for our blue shark data, this is not super useful. It's more applicable to a data set structured like a GLATOS data set would be, where um, the way GLATOS manages their data is that their receivers are grouped into arrays. So we would have a GLATOS array column that would link multiple receivers together into, a re into an array, which we could then select on. Um, in this case, we are selecting on our station numbers, so it's, uh, it's trickier, it's harder to get a meaningful subset, um, but I will show you what the code looks like just in case you have a data set where you could conceivably uh, select on a column like the GLATOS array column that groups your receivers a little more meaningfully than our data set does, um, because our data set doesn't really have an equivalent grouping column. But you can see here, we can uh, take a look at our receivers briefly. Oop, ah, I have not read my receivers in. So I'm just going to go back up here right under our detections. I am going to say receivers, make that arrow, and I'm going to say read OTN deployments and rec file equals rec file name. Oop. Have I made a mistake here? Oh, it may not be called rec file. I'm sorry. I'll just pass that. In. There we go. Okay. Um, and just to make sure that I have done this right, ed receivers. Yeah. Okay. So there's our receivers. Good. Okay, now that we have our receivers imported using this read OTN deployments function, we should be able to do this situation. Yeah, so there's our, the first 62 receivers anyway, our won't print them all. Uh, and we are gonna make a subset of our receivers. We are the same way that we sliced out just a single animal ID, we are going to slice out just a few receivers by using this in function, or operator, that's the word I'm looking for, uh, that will take, uh, it, it'll only select those elements in receiver station that are in this list. So we're gonna pull out HFX 005, 031, and 040. So we'll do that. And when we print that out, you can see that we have, yeah, we are only pulling out those receivers that are at those stations. Um, for now, we're gonna talk about uh, making an abacus plot with the receiver history. Now that we've got our receivers pulled into a data frame, we can put that in our abacus plot to show our receiver history. So that's gonna let us not only see uh, where, the, um, where our shark has showed up, it's also gonna let us uh, see a little more clearly its path through those receivers over time. So, um, because this uh, package was originally designed to work with GLATOS datasets, uh, it is going to look for a GLATOS array column. Like I was saying before, GLATOS array uh, is, um, it's a column that GLATOS datasets have representing this notion of a, uh, a group of receivers making an array, um, which makes a little more sense when you're operating in a lake, uh, less so maybe when you're out in the open ocean um, to, to cluster your receivers that way. Um, but the code is going to look for that column. So when you're doing this, you sort of have to think about what um, what column in your data or what column can you add to your data that is going to um, that is going to give you the, the 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 equivalence that you want this is one of the maybe the shortfalls of glatos is that uh, it is a little bit it is still a little bit purpose-built, and it's moving away from that a little, I think, in places, um, but it might not be the right, the right way to handle your data. It's very useful, 
but you do have to be aware of its origins and what it was built to do. In this particular case, uh, we are going to be using our station column as being roughly equivalent to a GLATOS array. Um, and that'll give us a, that, that in this case will serve as a pretty good approximation. So I'm going to mutate that new column onto my receiver's data frame, thusly. And uh, that's just gonna add that column. Essentially, we're just duplicating the station's column and tacking it on to the end of the data frame. But once we have that, we can pass the receiver's array into the receiver history parameter. When we run that, you can see, uh, or you will be able to see after I morph my screen again. Uh, we've added in a couple of other parameters just to change the way it looks a little bit, control the aesthetics. Um, and uh, yeah, you can see that we now have this line tracking through the stations, showing us uh, not only when from the x-axis, uh, it, it, uh, the, the shark appeared there, um, but this path that we can sort of follow uh, charting its course through the receivers. Uh, so again, useful thing to be able to do. We are going to now move on to some plots that'll actually put your, um, put your data in its geographic context. Uh, first, I'm gonna show you a couple of bubble plots. First thing I gotta do is make sure that I have these two libraries. Uh, my screen is still being shared, yep, okay, good. Uh, first thing I gotta do is import raster and SP. Once you've got those, we are going to need to get a uh, shape file. Uh, there are multiple different sources of shape files. Um, you can uh, yeah, uh, you can get them from wherever you wherever is most convenient for you. Uh, but for this workshop, we are going to be getting one from GADM, which is the Global Administrative Boundaries Reference. Um, what we are going to do is first uh, pull down a, uh, a shape file of Canva. You can see here, we are running this get data function. We are uh, reaching out to GADM and we are pulling down Canada. We're pulling it in at level one. So that's, um, that's going to give us just the provincial boundaries, I think. I forget exactly how the levels map onto the, the map, but that's the level that you're pulling in is basically the amount of detail that you're, that you're getting, I believe is how it works. So I'll run that. Uh, and ah, yes, I've already downloaded it, so I don't think it'll run again. Um, but uh, when you run that, you may get a little prompt telling you that it's, uh, it's downloading that. So it shouldn't take too long. Um, of course, it depends on your internet connection. Once we've done that, though, we are going to run this line of code, which is going to just take the part of that large polygon of the entirety of Canada. Uh, it's just going to take the part corresponding to Nova Scotia. So pull that out there. And now we have NS. So, okay, bubble plots. First thing I'm going to do is just wrap my detections filtered in a head so I don't print the whole thing. Um, but just making sure that we've got our detections filtered, uh, which we do, great. Um, so what we are gonna do with this is we are gonna make a bubble plot, which is gonna show us uh, where our, uh, where off the coast of Halifax our, um, our fish showed up. So we are gonna pass all of our data into this function detection bubble plot. So we're gonna pass it detections filtered as the detections is gonna plot. Again, we're gonna use station for our location. We're gonna pass it uh, our NS shape file as the map. Uh, the map is Nova Scotia, our NS polygon that we pulled in. Uh, the call grad here is our color gradient. So we're gonna be going from white to green um, for our uh, number of detections, I believe is what that corresponds to. And our background xlim and background ylim are the lat long that we are going to use as the bounding for our plot. So, a lot of parameters. What does that actually look like when we plot it? It takes a second because it's a, it's, it's a larger plot than our previous ones. So now you can see our plot. So, um, we have just the coastline of Nova Scotia, which 
in this particular case, uh, there are some shortfalls, notably um, Nova Scotia has become an island, as you can see, because we've just got the border of the province. Um, that may pose a problem depending on where you're working from, it may not. It's just a useful thing to have in mind. But you can see that our detections are plotted. Um, most of them are up here uh, off of the Halifax line of receivers that we have there. A couple of them are down there. I don't know what to do with those ones. I can't explain that. I'm not a fish person. I know what happened there. Oh yeah? Yeah, uh, the lost and found receiver, Halifax 35. Yeah. That's where it washed up. Oh, interesting. Oh, that's neat. That's really neat. Well, plots can show you that sort of thing and give you those kinds of insights into your data. Yeah. One day we will have an exercise where you guys will have to tell me when it washed up by looking at the detections that it saw and where its neighbors were. One day, not today. Okay. Um, but yeah, you can see that our, our color gradient is going from white to green uh, based on the number of detections. So you can see we have paler dots here, then quite dense dots towards the middle, and then paler dots again on the way out. So that is a bubble plot. You can see one line of code and a few parameters can give you a plot that can tell you a lot of, about your data. Uh, we can do uh, a few, we can add a few extra parameters to give ourselves a different plot. Um, there are all kinds of parameters for these functions, both abacus plot and bubble plots. Uh, I suggest you play around with them, see what you can make, see what's gonna be good for you. Uh, I'll show you a couple more here, uh, just to give you an idea of what you can do aesthetically. Um, we are gonna get a little, we, uh, we're gonna change our boundaries a little bit. We're gonna get a little more precise. Uh, we can also change our uh, symbol radius to, um, I mean, you'll note that this is a little bit cluttered. Uh, those symbols are, are fairly large, the bubbles on our bubble plot. Uh, we can make them a little smaller. Uh, we're gonna keep using white and green. Um, if we run that, and again, it's gonna take a little while. Uh, oh, and should be done. Okay, so there we go. You can see now um, we've zoomed in, we've changed our boundaries a little bit, uh, and you can see that our um, our line is a little more spread out because we're zoomed in further. Our symbols are smaller, so it's easier to see, uh, but you can still see that white to green gradient uh, showing us where um, the greatest density of detections is picked up. So that's just to show you, there's a lot you can do visually with these plots. Um, so by all means, experiment, find out what works for you, check out the docs, see what options you can pass in uh, and express your data in the way that's gonna be the most useful and the most insightful to you. So we've done some bubble plots. Now it's time to do some animations. I've been hyping this up the whole time. Let's, let's do an animation and see what we get. For the purposes of this, we're just gonna be animating one fish. Uh, we're gonna go back to NSBS hooker. Uh, and we need to also subset the date so that we're animating within a particular date range. In this case, we are just going to animate our detections over the year of 2014. So we're gonna do that, subset that out. And boom, all right. We are also gonna crop our Nova Scotia polygon to just outside of Halifax Harbor. Uh, the reason that we're gonna do that is it's less computationally intensive to work with a smaller polygon. Uh, so we are just gonna crop our NS polygon and we're gonna pass in an extent that roughly matches up with the area that we want. Um, and that is gonna give us our Halifax uh, polygon. The first thing that we are going to do is we are just going to plot our uh, our shape file so that we know that we've got the right area. I think if we go over here, yep, we can see there. That's the part of Nova Scotia that contains Halifax Harbor. So uh, we're we're good to go. We've got a shape file that's not too big and will just show us the area that we want. Uh, we can also put our points on it. Uh, using our deploy lat and deploy long, uh, the data that we've just subsetted from detections, 
uh, and our, we, we can make them red so that they stand out. We do that, then you can see, great, right there. There's our detections for NSBS hooker, also down there, um, as we discussed. Um, so, okay, now we know what we are gonna be looking at when all this is done in terms of our data, anyway. We've got a, we've got a good, good bead on what we're dealing with. We've got our shape file, we got our detections, we know what we're gonna be animating. So, this is the part where we are uh, going to be using make transition with invert. Um, we've discussed this uh, at the start, um, but what the transition layer is, is a, uh, a raster image uh, that codes every pixel to be either uh, one or zero. It's a least cost algorithm. So it's actually that uh, water is zero and land is one. So uh, movement between uh, two points uh, of water, the cost of that is zero, zero to zero. It's zero, great. If at any point we cross over land, uh, then the, um, uh, that's zero to one, the cost of that is one, uh, that's the, the program will throw an error in that case because your fish is trying to move on land. I'm not a biologist, but I think that doesn't technically, that doesn't typically happen. So our transition layer is going to, right, like I said, it's a raster image, water is zero, land is one. It's just gonna let our animation know, let us know what's water, what's land. So we are going to uh, use this make transition with invert function. In normal GLaTOS, this function would just be called make transition. Uh, again, we're inverting because GLaTOS will think a polygon is a lake. So uh, we're gonna pass it our Halifax shape file Res is our resolution. In this case, we're going to ask for 0 0.1, 0 0.1, and we are going to tell it, yes, please invert. So, on that, that's going to take a little while, but there we go. Great. Um, we, now that we have that, we can, plot, uh, the, we can plot the raster of our transition layer uh, the same way that we plotted our shapefile. And you can see what that looks like right here. Um, it looks like Halifax as rendered on an Atari 2600, but um, it'll become clearer when we add the shape file and you can see that. Oh, there we go. So that is our shape file. There's the uh, green uh, and there's the, the land in the middle. Um, you can see that our, uh, our resolution is quite low. Um, that's not super useful to us. Uh, when your resolution is this low, it's really easy to get, uh, erroneous data because the border between land and water is quite fuzzy. So what we're going to do is instead, uh, we are going to run the same code, but we are going to up our resolution by, uh, a few significant digits uh, to get a better um, to get a better resolution and get something that more accurately reflects our um, uh, our coastline. So I'm going to run that, and this is going to take a little time. Um, this is one of the reasons that we can't just keep cranking the resolution up as far as we want. The higher resolution you want. The longer it takes to render, the more time it takes, the more computationally intensive it's going to be. Um, so it's up to you to dial in a balance that is uh, accurate without taking, you know, days and days to render correctly. Uh, um, our uh, higher resolution transition layer has finished plotting. You'll recall we plotted one, didn't look so good. So we've uh, created another. Um, we'll plot that now and drop the, uh, uh, the Halifax shape file onto it. And you can see there, that's much higher resolution. That's looking a lot better. That's got our, um, that's got our coastline represented much more clearly uh, as a shape file. So that's, um, that's good. That's much, uh, that's gonna be much more useful for us. Um, 
we're going to do uh, a, um, we're going to check our fish detections by adding them to the map. Um, this is just going to, like before, let us know that all of our, um, all of our detections are in the right place. Um, that is in the water. Um, for the purposes of just checking that, we are going to pull out the unique deploy lat and deploy long from our detections file and plot that. So that'll just cut down on, because we're just checking that the, um, that the, the detections have been made in the right place, we just want to know that those places are actually in the water. So that'll uh, make things a little speedier to just use those unique values. So we do that and boom, we can see just like before, we're way out in the water where we need to be, uh, which is great. That's, that's good for us. So we've got our transition layer. The next step is to interpolate a path between our points. And we can do that with this interpolate path function. Uh, we are going to pass it our detections, det. Uh, we are going to pass it our transition layer, which is the transition part of tran1, which is our, our higher resolution layer, our transition layer. Yeah. And we are going to tell it how to give us our output. In this particular case, we are going to uh, ask it to give us our output as a data table. Um, there are other options, and data table may not be right for what you're doing. Uh, what the other options are and how they work is a little beyond scope. So uh, for now, uh, all I can do is advise you to uh, check out some of the other options, see what's going to work for you. But we run this. And you see we get a little uh, progress bar here that is going to tell us um, when we're done interpolating the path. That progress bar filled up real fast. Yeah, there we go. There we go. Okay. So. So here it won't be as interesting a set of paths because we don't have a lot of obstacles in our way. Yeah, it's not... Um, it's not super impressive. Uh, if we were dealing with data from inside the lakes, we might be able to see it go up, down, and around the river, as you showed off, John, with, with your maps. Um, there is inf interesting information to be had. Um, but yeah, this is not going to be too impressive. Yeah. We uh, might try this at a future OTN study hall on some of the data from like uh, up in the Minus Passage or something like that. There's some more interesting features to run around there. Yep. Um, so now that we've got our data points, we're going to make frames out of those data points. Um, and uh, one thing, before you do it, you may need to run this line of code, which you know, if you are doing this on your own time, um, this will just install the FFmpeg library, which is what GLaDOS uses to make the animation. Um, if you don't have it, it, there is a, um, the error message will tell you to install it, so it'll be a reminder for you. Um, but you may need to run it before you run make frames. But once you've got it, you can run this, and it will make your frames. So, uh, go. Yep, yep, good. Um, so that, I think, video and frames in. Oh, I've got my working directory set to just be my home directory. That's fine. We can just dig that up. I'm sure it's a moment here. Oh, wait, there we go. All right. So in here, my messy home folder, um, you can see there's our animation. So if we open this up, come on. Uh, it's going to buffer. And once it's done, you can behold what we have labored to produce, uh, which is, as John intimated, not especially impressive, uh, but you can see that it does create an animation. Now, this is not super impressive. Uh, part of that is because, as John said, we don't have a whole lot of obstacles. We don't have a whole lot of uh, interesting things for our fish to do. Um, so it doesn't show us much 
that's uh, that's necessarily very interesting. Um, but also, Glatos's uh, animation programs may prove to you to be a little restrictive. Um, maybe you want more than this can do. Um, if that's the case, there's a uh, a parameter you can pass. Um, oh yeah, you can pass uh, a parameter called animate false, and that will just get you these composite frames. So you can see in addition to the animation itself, it's printed out the frames that it's used in that animation. So if you want, you can pass animate uh, false to your uh, to your your function, uh, your make frames function, and it will just give you the pictures, won't bother making the animation. Uh, and that can be useful if you want to take those frames and put them in your own animation software, mess with them manually, create your own animation. Those are all valid things to do as well. Uh, and you may find that's what works for you. Um, I think that's the bulk of it. I think I'm a little over time too, so I don't, you know, I don't want to ramble on for too much longer. Um, but that's the gist of it. Visualization and animations with GLATOS. Thanks for watching the Ocean Tracking Network on YouTube. If you enjoyed this presentation, there's a good chance you'll like some of the other videos in this series. Click on the link in the description below for the workshop playlist, where you can learn more about the R programming language and some R packages suitable for exploring and plotting acoustic telemetry data. Keep up to date with our latest videos by tapping the subscribe button or clicking over on this list to see more workshops in this series.